The spiritual path is not always a comfortable path. I remember being in Bali one time when Gurudev decided to go for a walk and a bunch of us decided to follow him. There was only one complication. The walk he was embarking on went through the water over rocks and I was amazed how fleet-footed he was. It was as if he glided along whilst we were all struggling and along that walk I got abrasions and my feet got cut and yet I was totally happy following the master and I was also reminded that the path of having a guru in one's life is not always smooth. There are rocks and there will be abrasions and all these things are for our betterment too and that was incredibly clear to me the year after I became a teacher I had gone from being chief executive of a up-and-coming software company first company in New Zealand to raise angel investment and it seemed like every move we made the media loved us we became the darling of the medias and I let it get to me a little bit. I let it get to my ego. And you know, I became a teacher and then within a short space of time, I became the teacher's coordinator for the country. That's when things started to get really challenging. When I was a child, my mother and father separated when I was young. And from that point forward in my life, I always loved harmony to be around me because I'd had two parents who weren't even together, let alone harmonious together. Although they did later become harmonious separately. So whenever there were two groups who didn't get on with each other, it was as if that whole divorce was being reenacted again. And I felt like the child in the middle trying to get people to like each other so they didn't blow apart. And just such a schism happens as it often happens in any organization, happened within our own organization, where there was a schism. My own teacher, who I was fiercely loyal to, and been loyal all through my life, and I felt so much gratitude to her for everything she'd done, not only teaching me, but being the reason that I'd continued on the path when so many times I could have eared off and she'd been there and supported me and encouraged me and sometimes pushed me and confronted me to stay on that path. And the group of people who were the locals in Auckland who had become friendly with, who were nurturing me and helping me as well, and I felt a great affinity and friendship for them also. And yet, there was not an affinity between these two groups. And I felt torn. And I allowed myself to lose myself in trying to create harmony between these two groups. And I didn't handle it well. One time I was influenced by one group, another time by another. And I became like a jellyfish, tossed around by the opinions of these groups towards each other. And as a result, I ended up falling out with both groups. And that was a tough chapter of life. I felt lonely and I felt let down that in a spiritual organization where I was looking for a sense of family and harmonious family, I was experiencing the opposite. And I also felt down on myself because I realized I didn't have the powers to be able to help these groups in any way come together. I was powerless. And in fact, every move I made just antagonized myself, was naive, sometimes destructive or counterproductive to the very harmony that I was seeking to create. In trying to dissolve the politics, I'd become more part of it than ever before. And there were times when I even engaged in activities which weren't part of my nature, such as talking negatively about other people behind their backs 
what's called tamzik friendship. All of these things occurred. And, as no surprise, the more that I permitted myself to indulge in standards which are beneath what I held myself to account for previously, and certainly not what is professed in the spiritual path, and what is even told to be the sort of tamzik friendship that one avoids, the getting together to discuss a common foe, here I was, indulging in exactly that behavior, which felt good at the time, but was disastrous in terms of my energy. And what happened? I lost respect in the eyes of other people. I lost my self-respect. I felt torn. I felt stressed. I felt uncomfortable. Constantly flip-flopping from one perspective to another, not knowing where I was in the process. And there was also big repercussions to life. The financial stability that I'd had just a year before evaporated. We made three investment decisions, one after the other, which went pear-shaped. We bought a juice bar, which juiced us. My wife was working in the juice bar for negative income. She was working 50-hour weeks, and we were taking home less than we started each month with. Meanwhile, the value of that asset went down and down and down. The contract work that I had been doing dried up. The new coaching work that I'd embarked on trying to start going fizzled. And suddenly, we had no reserves, no income, negative income. All the investments we had had turned sour, and things had flipped on their head completely. And then, my brother's wedding was coming up in Mexico. We didn't even have the money to take the family there again. We cancelled two of the flights to save what little money we had left. We had to borrow money to keep ourselves afloat. I hastily started applying for jobs. And then a deliverance. The day before I boarded that flight from Mexico, one of the jobs I applied for. Now remember, I'd been an entrepreneur. Even having to apply for a job in a corporation again was to swallow a healthy dose of humble pie. And I get the call from my recruitment agent. Daniel, you, you're through and they're going to make you a job offer, offer later today. I said, fantastic. What time will they make it? They said, probably around two o'clock. I said, that's perfect because I bought a flight at six. I'll be out of contact by five. Perfect. Then what happened? Two o'clock came and went. Three o'clock came and went. Four o'clock came and went. Starting to get a bit nervous. I ring up the agent and I say, hey, well, what's happening? And he said, Daniel, I don't know how to tell you this. This has never, ever happened in all my years of recruitment. At this late stage, they've actually withdrawn the position. I couldn't believe it. Here I was about to board a flight to Mexico in December, the worst time of year possible, because by the time I got back, it was late December. New Zealand falls to sleep for those six weeks, and that was another six weeks with no job secured over Christmas, over New Year, over the summer break. I was not looking forward to the experience of being in Mexico. I get to Mexico. And I'd budgeted just enough money. What I didn't realize was that in Mexico, people love to go out each evening and socialize. And here I am, literally having to ask friends and family members for money each night so that I have enough to spend on the bare minimum of food so that I can subsist beyond what I'd have budgeted for. I call this chapter of life the beggar in Mexico because I was literally having to beg people for food to eat my brother, meanwhile, was getting married in the biggest church in South America. It was a grand festival. 
He was filled with abundance and radiance, as was his wife. I wasn't even there with family because we couldn't afford to bring them over. No job, no money, lots of debt. And what allowed me to get through that time, more than anything, was whatever spiritual knowledge I'd remembered. I certainly wasn't applying a lot of it, but I felt great for my brother. Those jealousies and sibling rivalries of childhood had evaporated, and I want nothing but the best for him. And he must have sensed that despite my financial difficulties that I was there for him, for he did me the great honor of asking me at his wedding, can you please, brother, do the talk that dad would normally have done? Of course, our father had passed away a couple of years earlier. And I had tears in my eyes and I said, bro, I would be honored. And I did it. I came home from that experience. And then things shifted. It was as if in that act of being there, being present, and going through the tapas, the pain, the hardship, the ego polishing of that experience, and still being able to just be there for my brother. Things started to turn on the head. Within three weeks of getting back, at the wrong time of year, the company that had withdrawn the job position, reinstated it, re-offered me the job. Another organization offered me a job. A third organization offered me the job. Then the recruitment agent himself said, Daniel, would you consider working with us as a recruitment agent in our company for job offers? And I remember saying to a friend of mine, I have no idea why I've been given these four job offers. I mean, one I'm probably not going to take, but it's not in my sector. But three, which are directly related to things I can do. And then she shared with me her experiences of, at her work, the sort of freedoms she'd been entitled to take time off, to do out of living work, to do teaching, to do volunteer work. And I was like, huh. I see why I've been given three job offers. Negotiating leverage. Or words to that effect. And I remember it sitting in a state of utter dispassion. Talking to the person who was offering me the job that I didn't want to take because I had a preference and I had a choice. And I was very honest and I said, James, to be very honest, I'm flattered by the job offer. I'm humbled by it. And I've been offered this other job that suits me better for these reasons. But look, we're here. Let's chat anyway. Who knows? Um, let's just see what happens. And we chatted. And as we got chatting, I realized I liked the guy. And I said, you know what? I work for this organization called The Art of Living. And to be honest, I don't really care about the salary package. But what I do care about is, uh, you know, that I can have some time to, to do the things that really give my life meaning. He leaned in. He went, yeah, tell me more. I said, well, you know, I don't want to go out on a limb here, but what I would really love is, well, I'm having another child this year. He said, yep, two weeks, pay paternity leave. You've got it. Oh, great. Didn't even have to ask. Well, that's great, James. And you know what? There's also this course that I want to do. Yeah, what is the course? Well, it's in Bali. That's okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's an out-of-living course. It's a silent meditation retreat. And I honestly think that would be great for the work that I do here because this relies on communication skills and this helps. He said, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I said, could I call that professional development? He said, I think we could. I said, James, if I was to put to you that your company was able to give me the, the leave, paid leave, and pay for the course and and the air tickets over to Bali to do this professional de development, would that fly? He said, Daniel, if that's your suggestion, I would say, where do I sign? I could not believe his answer. 
suddenly I had eight weeks paid leave. All expenses paid trips twice in a year to go to Bali to attend an advanced meditation retreat for a job which was working in corporate telecommunications. I later found out that anyone in that company, even the CEO, had to get board approval to even get local flights approved. I have no idea to this day how he managed to swing it that I got two international flights signed off as part of my employment contract, but I did. And it was as effortless as anything. I was totally taken care of. You know, that experience showed me that uh, things won't always be smooth on the spiritual path. In fact, sometimes they'll be really rocky. But the reason things are rocky is when you need the lesson. And when you're not seeing what the lesson is, that's where things get rockier. And when you're blaming people and events, that's when things get rockier for you. When you're failing to see your part in a situation, as I certainly was, that things is where things get mega rocky. But the moment you remember to apply spiritual knowledge, the moment you remember to be there for another person, to put your own ego or your own needs to one side, that's the turning point. That's where you leave space for grace and miracles start to occur. We have an expression in Art of Living. We say, I don't believe in miracles. I rely on them. And if you talk to any teacher who's been on this path, they'll share multiple miracles they've had. I'm sure you can identify with this, with some of the wrong paths I was going down by how this pivoted. And I share this story really with the blessing that your life may become a stream of miracles so great that they cease to even amaze or surprise you.